Hey, this is Jason, part of the City Church Media Team, here with your big three announcements for the week. Up first, next week we start a brand new series entitled Generous Living. Come learn how to give not because you're supposed to, because you want to out of love for God and for other people. Next, on Sunday night, November 12th, we're going to have a combined connect group that week at Pastor John and Shanda's house with a big bonfire. Well, we're not going to make their house a bonfire. We're going to have a bonfire at their house. See Pastor John and Shanda for the time and the address. And lastly, don't forget, next week, if you don't have kids, it's one of the best Sundays of the year because you get an extra hour sleep when you fall back. If you have kids like ours who wake up every single day at the same time, it's not going to help at all. But we're going to be here, and we hope to see you there too. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for connecting, growing, and sharing with us here at City Church Greenfield. Okay. Hi, welcome. It's so good to have you guys here. Those that come here regularly, those who are new, those who come here sometimes. It's so good to have everyone here. I love it. Uh, let us join together. Let's stand and join in the call to worship today from Psalm 27, verse 1. And I'll read the leader part. You guys read the all part. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh, thank you, God, that you are the one who is with us. You are the stronghold. You are the light. And we don't have to fear anything. Let's worship together today as we ask God to build his kingdom, not just in heaven, but here on earth, so that we can join in and worship him. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope that pop our in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power.
Christ is the light, and he called us to be the light of the world. And this song, I feel like, calls us to be the ones who, in the darkness of the world that is around us, we get to be the ones who point people to the one who can give them hope. And so we ask Jesus to shine so that he can be our source of light as well. As we gaze on your king, we brightness, so our faces display your lightness. Lord, that you would be with Zyra, 
as well. Touch her back, Lord. And um, Lord, she has a job that requires her to be there. And we ask, Lord, that you would just um, help her today, that she'd be able to rest and uh, find healing, we pray. We ask that you would continue to help Jennifer in her healing process with her leg. And we just thank you, Lord, for how you have helped over these weeks and months. And we ask that you would continue to do so. Lord, we give you praise for what you have done in these few months that we've been worshiping together and as you've been drawing your people. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would continue to do so. And may we find joy in being in your house. And may we find uh, strength in being with others who love and worship and serve you. And Lord, we ask that you would just now help us to take in today what we need from what you have ahead for us in Christ's name. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Jason, and he's going to come. Candy City Day, but just for 10 seconds, just close your eyes maybe and just think, what if today was it? Who would you call? What would you do? Would your life look any different? What would you tell them when you call? Is there someone where you've had some really ugly family relationship stuff and you haven't talked in a long time and you want to make sure everything's right before you go meet your maker? Is there anything you want to say to your wife and your husband and your kids? What would you do? I, I, I love the question, not because I'm morbid, uh, not because I'm, you know, I'm weird, but I'm not that weird. But I love the question because there's times in my life, and I'm sure this is true of you as well, that I can just get a little too much. There's too much stress, too much things to get done, too many plates to spin, right? You're just spinning, spinning, spinning. And then every once in a while, I like to ask my question, take a breath and go, all right, Jason, if this was it, is this, if this is my last day, is this how I want to spend my brain energy? Is this is how I want to spend my physical time. This is how I want to be thinking. Because if I get really worried about something or anxious about something I have to get done or something that's coming up, and I think, man, is it really going to matter in, in the light of eternity? Probably not. Is it going to matter tomorrow? Probably not. A week from now? Five years from now? No way. So why am I letting it... Con Bring so much energy into my mind. It's because we're human, right? We, we tend to do that. We worry about things. We, we get stressed out about stuff. If we can stop every once in a while and just think in the moment, this reduces my stress level. Go, all right, is, real, is it really that important that the light of eternity and I can exhale and I can breathe? I feel a little better. If I get distracted in the moment, I get preoccupied with my you trying to clear out 10,000 emails. Am I the only one that has like thousands of emails? I, I used to keep on track of that. I used to try to get zero, zero. And then it became like an obsession where I had to get to zero. I mean, is anybody get to keep it at zero all the time? Hey, I tried, I tried, I get so much spam, and I'm like, oh, that's, you know what, I'm, the important things I'm going to get to, the things, and Brooke has like 66,000 emails, it makes me stress me out looking at her phone, and she never, you know how you, you scroll up and you, you close the apps out from your phone? I, I Give me your phone, and it takes me five minutes just to close all of her apps. And my phone's running out of battery all the time. Well, it's because you've got 1,000 apps open at all times. Sometimes you gotta close the app, and the same thing in our own mind. Sometimes we gotta just <sighs> kind of reset, start over, and go. All right, does this really matter? Is this thing that I'm stressed out about? Is that really going to have an impact on eternity? The truth of it is, most of us think we have an endless amount of days. We we don't want to think about death. We think we've got 
Just loads and loads of time, endless number of days at our disposal. And we act like we always have time that, you know, when I get X, Y, and Z done, and then I'm going to get to this really important thing. And then I'm going to make up with my father. Then I'm going to make amends with my uncle. And then I'm going to then I'm going to go talk to my aunt. And then I'm going to make it right with my sister. You fill in the blank. I'm going to improve my relationship with God. I'm going to get it straight as soon as I can get this work thing done. As soon as I can save this much money, as soon as I can just graduate from this or finish this thing or get this promotion, I'll, I'll, then I'll start investing in my marriage more. Then I'll really start to take time and, and listen to my spouse. I'll play with my kids more. <laughs> Guilty. That, that when I get this done, then I'll play with my kids. That you know, But if it was my last day, would I do this thing or would I go play with my kids? Would I mend that broken relationship? Would I reach out that stubborn neighbor, who I'm not quite sure where they stand with God, and I would invite them to church, or at least ask them where they stand with God. This was my last day. And the list goes on and on. Would I actually share what Jesus has done for me to someone I know who might spend eternity away from God? If this was my last chance, would I spend time talking to them? The later never comes, and we don't get around to those things that are really important because and we, we just like, we don't like to think about it. You know, the Bible says that we're not promised tomorrow. I'm not trying to bring it, bring the mood down, but I want you to really self-reflect. If we're to be the light of the world, as we've been talking about, a city on a hill that can't be hidden, are we acting like that? Are we, are we acting as if, if this was our last chance to talk to someone who might spend eternity away from God, would we just share with them what Jesus has done for us? And what he can do for them. And man, it's awkward and weird and like, oh, it worked. And we religious conversation. Oh, no, thank you. That's weird. But if this was your last day at work, I'm like, hey, amen, that would be awesome. Would you do it? Would you do it? James, is, uh, James the brother of Jesus, uh, said this to his followers. This is in James chapter 4. We're going to be in John chapter 4. Uh, it's going to be on the screen, but if you want to follow along in your smartphone or your Bible, that's totally fine. We're going to be in John chapter 4. But before we get there, I want to read James 4. Just a couple of verses. James was the brother of Jesus. I mean, think about that for a second. James was the brother of Jesus. He was convinced that his own brother was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I have a hard time convincing my brother that I'm his brother sometimes. Can you imagine that? James believed that his brother was the Son of God. And so if you can convince his own brother, Jesus probably was who he said he was and did the things that he was going to do. And this is what James, the brother of Jesus, said to Jesus' followers. He said, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go to this city or that, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Verse 14, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's why each day we have to put first things first. We let our to-do list kind of guide our day. Instead, we've got to really think about getting plugged into the source. If we're going to be the light of the world, that's the first thing we need to do, right, is plug into the source, make sure our priorities are in line, and live that day every day as if it's your last day. So you can put your head on the pillow at night and say, yes, that was a day. <laughs> that was a full day. I didn't put anything off that was most important. I put the little things that I worried about off so I could focus on the most important things to do. And, and work, I know work, we all have to work, right? We have things to do. And God gave us work. We're supposed to work. It's good to work. You know, God, you know, he, he gave us the ability to work and to use our, our gifts and those things. Like, oh, man, I got to go to work. You're not wasting that day. God called you to do that. But when you're at work, are you living a full life? Are you having God conversations? Are you living your life to the fullest? Or are you just trying to get by? To the next day, to the weekend, to the next paycheck, and it's just a cycle going over and over. Live like it's your last day, because, well, it could be, but more than that, God called us, Jesus told us, that he came to give us a full life. And if we're to be the light of the world, and we've got a half-empty life, you know, it's like, ugh, I want to be like him? Probably not. That doesn't look very attractive. Like, that person's always down, that person's always worried, that person's always anxious, that person has always got his head, his or her head down, uh, looking, you know, what they're going to do next, and putting their priorities in front of everybody else's priorities. That's not what Jesus was talking about when he said they will recognize my followers by our love. 
Are you loving? Are you kind? Are you living out the fruit of the Spirit? That's what being the light of the world is. It's not an anxious life. It's not a depressed life. It's not a sad. It's a steady, peaceful, anchored on the rock kind of life. And so if you want that kind of life, lean into this. Listen to this message today. There was a woman in the Bible. We're going to talk about one of my favorite stories. And she was living a life that was not pleasing to her community. Probably not in the eyes of God. But he, Jesus loved her so much, he shared himself with her. He was living his fullest life and wants us to do the same. Last week we said, or two weeks ago, we said Pastor Joshua preached a message about being salt of the earth. We're supposed to enrich people's lives, help preserve them, help in the healing process. Last week we talked about light. We said light comes from a source. Light will illuminate any darkness. And the last point to ponder is our big idea of today, which is light will go out if unattended. We talked about the, you know, if you watch Survivor, they like those fires. And you can imagine someone just getting the fire started. It's for a million dollars, and they're competing versus other person to like the biggest fire to burn this rope, and this black comes up. And imagine they just kind of get started. There's a small flame. They go, I'm good. I'm just going to let us see what happens. And magically see if it kind of blows. No, you've got to keep adding fuel to the fire, right? If you don't pay your light bill, eventually your lights are going to go out. You have to attend your light source. Light will go out if unattended. Any light source, a flashlight, if the batteries go dead, you don't replace the flashlight batteries, the flashlight's going to die. We use the example of the lightsaber, the glow-in-the-dark one. If you remember that, we held it up to the light. And you know, if you, if you have something glow-in-the-dark, eventually it goes dim unless you put it back in front of the light. And it's the same way with us. If we're not continually plugged into the light, our light will get dim. <coughs> in John chapter 4, Jesus is heading to an area um, in, uh, in the Middle East that was not pleasant for Jewish people to be in. He was going through, uh, through Samaria, and the Samaritans were, if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, why, this, why the Good Samaritan is such a great story is because it's the Samaritan, not the priest and not the religious person that helps the person that's been beat up and left for dead on the side of the road, but the Samaritan, and Jesus is making a big point. And the people listening to that would have been like, oh, no way, a Samaritan, because Samaritans were like, Phew. Like, for me, it would be like a Duke fan. I'm a huge Kentucky fan. We hate Duke. We call it puke. We can't stand it. It's a Christian Leitner. If you're, old, if you're younger than 1991, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I still have nightmares about Christian Leitner hitting this shot in 1991 or 92 or something like that. It, the, these people were, were not viewed upon. I mean, I don't know. Who's the Indiana's? Who's the Hoosier's, like, enemy? Do they have one? They have a rival? Kentucky. Kentucky? Kentucky? Not really. Um, <laughs> it is for Indiana. We could care less. Um, <laughs> get competitive and then we'll care. Um, no, in Indiana, um, so you'd be looking like a Kentucky fan coming and going, no, no thanks. I'm going to go hang out with my other Hoosier family. It'd be worse than that. These Samaritans were, were like, uh-uh. Jews and Samaritans didn't mix. So we're going to be in John chapter 4, and it says that now he, Jesus, uh, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Uh, Joseph, same Joseph we talked about a few weeks ago, the coat and the dreamer and the king, the second command of Egypt, the same guy. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, that's important to know that Jesus was tired. He had been walking a long time from his journey. He sat down by the well. It was about noon. So I'm just going to in, you know, kind of put my own spin on there, thinking that it's probably lunchtime, right? It's well, at least for me. If it gets to noon, I mean, I haven't eaten. I'm already angered, right? So he's tired from walking. It's lunchtime, so he's hungry. He's thirsty. And verse seven says, "When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink?'" Verse eight just says, "His disciples had gone into the town to buy food." Now, this right here is a big deal. So not only was this person a Samaritan, and Jesus was a Jewish, I mean, not only was he Jewish, he was a Jewish male, and he was a rabbi, he was a teacher. So he's like a male, and he's a teacher, so he's well respected. They would never, ever talk to a woman in public, alone especially, and they would never talk to a Samaritan woman. So this was a big deal. Deal. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Scripture says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10 said, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
Jesus just shares with her how to get closer to God. They were talking about water. She thinks they're talking about physical water. And he goes, listen, if, if you knew who I was and who was asking you for a drink, you know, he, he was just doing what was in front of him. He was tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He asked for a drink throughout a well. So that's all they had in common was water. And so he used that imagery. Same thing when we're talking to someone, we don't know where to start the conversation about God and ourselves. We just start with what you have, what, what there is in common. And all Jesus had was water. And he said, look, if you knew who was talking to you, I, I would give you living water. It's that easy. We're the ones that make it difficult. We're the ones that let the enemy whisper, oh, this is going to be an awkward conversation. Oh, man, if you work with them and you talk about God here in this your work environment, you're going to get labeled. It's going to be weird. We let the enemy whisper these things to us because he doesn't want the kingdom advanced. From everything that I've read, all the studies that I've seen, all the polls that I've seen, the Christian church, especially here in America, do, do, we do a very poor job of sharing our faith outside of the hour of church into the world. We do a poor job of actually talking to people about Jesus because we feel awkward or we feel unqualified or we feel in all those feelings and it's coming from the enemy. We're letting them whisper. It's not hard. You just live your life. Be the, being a light isn't getting a megaphone. We said that last week. You know what? You mean you can. Someone feels called to get a megaphone. Like I said, just don't wear your city church t-shirt. But if you want to go to a street corner and you want to preach with a megaphone, do that. But for most of us, normal people, we just want to just live your life out loud in front of people. And occasionally you get to use your words. When the Holy Spirit touches you on the shoulder and says, that person right there. <gasps> By work with them. Yes, that person. Okay. And all you do is share what you have in common. You share your story where you were before Christ and then what Christ did for you and Christ's story where those things came together. Or you just say, hey, would you like to come to church with me? But we don't do it because we let the enemy think it's more difficult. We let them whisper to us and we think it's more difficult than it is. Verse 11 says, the woman says, sir, you, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as he did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. A little side message. We're going to do a whole series next year on, on water. There's all kinds of really cool imagery, like Jesus uh, walking on the water and in the red. I mean, it's going to be really, it's going to be a great message series. But just for a half a second, this little side message, and this is for people who have already claimed to know Christ. So if you're watching online, if you're here today, you've not made your decision for Christ yet. Hey, first of all, you're in the right place. Please keep coming back. This is a place where you can come ask questions and see truth. We believe that the scripture says to taste and see the Lord is good. Knock at the door and it shall be answered to you. So. You know, keep watching it from home or keep coming and asking good questions. But for those of you that have, at some point in your life, said yes to Christ, you said, yes, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Let me ask you, and maybe for some of you it's been a long time ago, does your life, does, does the, the idea of being in a relationship with God, you know, well up in you like living water? Like it's going to come out and just burst out. You can't help it. To tell other people because you're so excited. Your gut inside goes, yes, I'm a part of the church. I'm a part of, a, I'm a child of God. Is there a spring of water? Do you feel like your relationship with God is welling up and overflowing? Does it feel like that or does it feel stale and stagnant? Like a, like a, like a pond that's going to turn green over time. You need like, a, like 18 Brita filters to even look at the, make sure that the water is, is clear. Where is your joy in your relationship from God? And I'm going to ask you, are you, are you plugging in to the source? Are you obeying his commands? Are you attempting to share your story with other people? We mentioned that last week. If you share your story and you invite someone to church and then you see them walk through the door, man, you're going to start to feel that wellspring in your life. You're going to go, man, it, this is awesome. I'm part of something bigger than myself, which is what we're all kind of searching for. All right, back to today's message. Jesus meets her, and she she is spiritually um, shallow. Okay, she's not right right there, and, and Jesus shows her the truth. Okay, there's there, there's a great I, a lot of my emails are trying to sign in grace and truth, Jason, Pastor Jason, whatever. 
in grace and truth. And if you see that, this, this is the reason why I sign my emails, grace and truth, because that's what Jesus was It is. Jesus is full of grace. There's nothing that we can do that's going to make us so far gone that we can't repent and turn back to Christ, where he is not ready for us to come back. He's with us through, the, through all that muck, through all that garbage, through all those bad decisions. He's there with us in the pain and the hurting. And at any moment we want to turn back to him, God will do that. He is full of grace. There's nothing we can do. The scripture says nothing that we can do that, we, that will turn us from, from Christ. Nothing that we can do. Yet, at the same time, Christ is full of truth. And that at one point in this story, will Jesus ever lower the bar for morality, for what is right and what's wrong? He, he, never, he never says, well, it's okay, it's kind of sort of, you're fine, just kind of keep going, you know, it's all cool. No, he always raises the bar. He wants us to get closer to God, closer to his Father. He wants to raise that accountability bar. At the same time, he's a, it's a beautiful balance of mercy and and grace and forgiveness. So that's what we're trying to do. So Jesus said, the woman said in verse 15, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. And he's like, this sounds amazing. Like, can you imagine drinking water and never being thirsty again? Give me this water that if I get thirsty. Uh, and I have to keep coming here to draw water. So she starts kind of deflecting. She says, well, hey, hey you're, you're, he tells me about how to have eternal wellspring of eternity. And she asks about the physical water. She keeps the, the conversation going on this physical need. So Jesus kind of cuts right to the point. Verse 16, he said, he told her, hey, uh, go tell your husband and, and come back. 17, verse 17, she, the lady says, I, I have no husband. You can kind of see her kind of maybe put her head down. She finger, her feet kind of go back and forth. I, I, I have no, no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands. And the man that you have now is not your husband. So what you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. You know, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming. You will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is coming from the Jews. He's talking about himself. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Dude, what a cool story. She knew that the Messiah was coming. She knew enough about um, ancient texts. She knew enough about the, the, the religious ideas of the, of the time and the area. She knew there was this Messiah that was coming who would bridge the gap between us and God. Who would fill in all those voids from when, we, when sin entered the world through the sin of Adam and Eve, that there was going to be a way to restore, come in right standing, and God was going to send this Messiah to restore us so we could have right standing with God. The foundation was there, so Jesus shares his story. Really cool stuff in this story. I mean, amazing things. I'm going to give you four quick points to ponder that you can take it home with you. You can use it at Connect Group or you can use it around your dinner table. Talk with your kids about it. Talk about it with your, with your spouse. Um, here's the things that we take the sermon and we chew on it more during the week. And here's the first one. Number one, Jesus broke social norms. Jesus broke social norms. He did something, first of all, speaking to a Samaritan, speaking to a woman. He this Again, he was a rabbi. It was not a social norm. So that means you might have to talk to somebody that you usually don't talk to. If your life is going to have a wellspring and you're going to be the light of the world, that means you have, might, might have to go someplace that you normally don't go. Now, I'm not asking you to be a missionary. You know, I'm not calling you, who, who wants to go to Africa? You know, and that God may lay that on your heart, and that's totally fine. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about at work. I'm talking about what you do after work. Because what most of us try to do is just get home as quick as possible and go to, you know, the Paramount Plus, Netflix, Disney Plus, whatever. You know, streaming TV, right? Da, 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 da. What might God be calling you to do that's going to be a little different it's going to break a social norm so you might be in the right place at the right time to talk to the person that God's got in your way. 
There's going to be people that I never see, and I'll never be able to talk to you as your pastor, that you are going to be able to be the light of the world to them. And all you have to do is just share your story. At the least, invite them to come with you to church. But you have to be there in order to do it. If you just are rushing home, and then every, you know, every day is at home, and all you do is, is watch TV, you're not going to get it done. Jesus broke social norms. This was a Samaritan woman. Jesus could care less. He did not care. And neither should we. If we're called to be light in the dark, and if we, we can't do that if we're afraid to go hang out with people that are not like us. If you've been a Christ follower for a long, long time, and you look around and all your friends are Christians, and all you do is go to church and go home, you're missing the point. You're not going and making disciples. We gotta do more. Those are great things to do. Absolutely should come to church. You should absolutely have Christian friends. You probably should have more Christian friends, non-Christian friends, right? But you need to be in the way of other people to know Christ. You've got to get to where they are, and you can't do that if you're just watching Disney+. Plus. Number two, Jesus took time to talk to her. Here's a big one that makes me feel guilty. Makes me feel a little more convicted. Jesus took time. He was... Jesus had a mission, right? If anyone had a mission, it was Jesus. He's only on the earth as an adult, right? He only had three years of ministry, right? He prepared 30 years for three years of ministry. He had things to do. You know, I always think, man, I'm busy. Jesus was super busy, and he was tired, and he was hungry. I'm thinking, man, okay, I'm not as important as Jesus, not even close. And sometimes I think, oh, i got a lot of church stuff to do. I really don't have time to talk to this person right now. Man, it's so convicting. You've got to take time. The person right in front of you is the most important person right there at, at that moment. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have priorities. You shouldn't set boundaries. Absolutely. Not every person you talk to has to be the most important person. But you, if God is nudging you and saying, that's the person you need to spend time talking to, then man, you need to listen to that. And don't let your justification go, oh, i got a lot of good things to do. i got a lot of important stuff, churchy things to do. i got X, Y, and Z. But listen, A, B, and C... Maybe to talk to the person right in front of you. Sometimes that's your spouse. Sometimes that's your kids. Sometimes that's someone at, at work. Jesus took time besides being tired and hungry. Like, Brooke and I don't even like to talk to each other if, we're, if we haven't got enough sleep and we have not eaten yet. Like, just, let's, like give me a cracker and then we'll talk. And give me something. You know, give me a kid, one of the kid snacks and then we'll talk. Jesus is tired. He's probably hangry, right? He was human. He stopped what he was doing and talk to her. This will not just happen in your schedule. Like It won't happen. If you're one of those people that are super busy, you're always busy, you might have to schedule listening time into your schedule. It won't just, you know, you can't create more time. You have to make time, which means you have to put it in your schedule. If you got someone important in your life, and you're not, you feel like you're not spending enough time, it's not going to magically get better if you don't make a change. What's that? phrase that Einstein said doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results is the definition of insanity. If you're going to listen to the important people in your life and the people that Jesus needs you to listen to, you've got to make time to do that. All right, number three. Jesus took time to talk to her, to be the light. And then last week, number three, Jesus took time to know who she was. He took time to get to know who she was. Now, Jesus cheated yeah, he did it supernaturally. And we don't we don't have the we don't have the ability to look at someone and say, Oh, so you've been married and divorced eight times. Like we don't we don't have the ability to do that. Jesus uses his supernatural ability because you know, again, he had a lot of things to do and he was super important, right? And he had a mission to do. Uh, but we can too have a supernatural ability. It's called taking time and actually listening and caring. And if we do take the time to listen and care, people will the people we like talking about ourselves, people will eventually open up to us and talk to us about what's going on in their life. If they think you actually care what they're saying. What's that old phrase? Like, people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. If you've never heard that before, I'm going to read it again. People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. If you genuinely take time and are actually listening to people and engaging them in conversation, getting to know them, they will listen to you and when you say, hey, would you like to come to church with me? That'll mean something to them. Hey, would you like to, to know Jesus as your Savior as I do? That will mean something to them. 
If you walk, you know, you're using the megaphone approach and you're walking up, hey, stranger, you're going to go to hell. Uh, you know, that's probably not going to work. I mean, occasionally, sure, it might work for one person of a million, but mostly it's us getting to know people. Are you doing that? Do you have room? Is there enough margin in your life for you to know new people, to care about their eternal destination, and take time out and talk to them? Because that's what Jesus did. If Jesus said, in John, I'm the light of the world, and then and Matthew says, we are the, you are the light of the world, you know, the word Christian comes from, a, it was actually a, like a slang. It was a made fun of name. It means little Christ. That's how we got our name, Christians. Um, they would say, oh, look at the little Christ. You're being like little Jesus. Uh, you know, you're being little, look how cute. Look, 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 look at the little Jesuses. And then we took that as a badge of honor and said, yes, yes, exactly. We're trying to be like Christ, little Jesuses. That's what we're doing. And that's then the name stuck. And that's why we have Christianity. If so, if we are really trying to be like Christ, are we breaking social norms? Are we actually taking time and investing in people's lives? Are we getting to know people? And the last one, Jesus offered her an alternative way to think about her life. Remember, full of grace and full of truth. At no point did he shy away. You know, he had been real easy. He didn't have to bring up, like, why did he bring up the five husbands? Like, he didn't, did not, didn't have to do that. But he knew that was something that bothered her. She knew that it was going to be in her reputation in town. You know, that had to affect her, especially a woman who had been married five times in the Middle East. I mean, five times in America, that's a lot. Five times. I mean, in 2023, that would be like, woo, you know, five times. Back then, that's, woo, big, big time. Like, whoa. He could have avoided that conversation, but he cut right to the heart of it. He's like, go, why don't you go get your husband? And we'll, then we'll talk. Oh, my goodness. Piercing. She's like, I don't even have a husband. I have five. He's yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. He, but he never, never lowered the bar what was right and what was wrong. But he poured on the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness. Jesus offered her another way to think about her life. She probably identified her life as just that person who had been married five times. She was worthless. She was bad, you know, had a bad reputation. Who knows? We can't, the scripture doesn't go into detail what she thought about herself. But you can think about it if that was you and you were living in that time and having that kind of reputation, what that would feel like. And maybe you have defined your life by your past mistakes. Maybe you define your life with your behaviors or not glorifying to God. And you think, man, I have just messed up so much, I can never be forgiven. Is, that is a lie from the devil. There's nothing that you can do, right? Nothing. Jesus will never lower the bar on truth, but raises the bar on grace. Listen to what happened to her. I'm going to skip down to verse 39. It's the last verse that we're going to share today. It says this, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Him. Who? Jesus. They had faith in Jesus. They believed in Him because of the woman's testimony. She made a huge difference in her community by accepting the living water. Despite, despite all of her past, despite all of her baggage, despite all of her things and her reputation, she took that moment with Christ, that encounter, and shared her story. And the many people from that town believe in Christ. And that's all it takes from us is to live like it may be our last day and that we actually care about the people around us. That we care enough to stay plugged into the source and keep staying plugged in day in and day out, even when it gets hard, even when it gets uncomfortable, even when it means loving someone who's not like us, who doesn't think like us, doesn't vote like us, who doesn't do X, Y, and Z like us. We have to open our minds and be loving, full of grace and mercy, yet at the same time pointing to the truth in Scripture and what Christ has put on us. We have a... Um, um, on Christmas Eve, we have, as I said, we have this tradition, we've never had Christmas Eve, we're only 12 weeks old, and in my family's tradition, uh, we usually attend a Christmas Eve service where we light a candle, some of you may have done that, uh, for some church service you've gone to where you kind of lit a candle and you kind of pass them, everybody give me a nod if you've done that, okay, uh, and then you kind of pass, it's, you're passing the flame, right, you're passing the candle and you stand in a circle or you stand in the rows and you sing Silent Night or something like that, and we'll do something like that on Christmas Eve, we're excited about that, but it's really symbolic because there's this candle in the middle that is the Christ candle. It's the flame, right? The light of the world. And then you light your little white candle and you get the wax and burn your hand unless you got one of those cool covers. And you light the candle and you pass it on 
to the next person who passes it on to the next person, and then soon the whole room that was dark is now filled with light. And that's a great imagery for us in this series as we close this out, that yes, you're supposed to be the light of the world. You can't do that if you keep it to yourself. You've got to get, stay plugged in. You've got to get it from the source. You've got to light your candle. And you've got to pass it to on and pass it on and pass it on. All God asks for us is to do the possible. To start a conversation about sports, about the weather, about their family, about themselves. All you do is you've got to start a conversation. All you have to do is just be in their way at some point. And God is probably already, you know, if I told you, think of someone uh, in your life that, that you, don't, you don't know where they stand with, with Jesus, and maybe you can have a conversation this week. You probably can think of someone pretty quickly. You, you might even be in the same family as them. You might definitely work with them or go to school with them. All God is saying, you, you do the possible, and I'll do the impossible. God is the one who does the saving. God is the one that does, performs the miracle. God is the one that sends His Holy Spirit. And we don't have to start convicting them. We don't have to talk about their past. All we have to do is share with them the light of Jesus. I'm going to ask uh, Josh to come back up. And maybe Austin too. Yeah. The whole band besides me is going to come back up. Jesus says this in John 15. Do we have that scripture? In John 15. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me... If you stay plugged in to me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus isn't asking you to do it by yourself. Apart from him, you can't do anything anyways. All he's saying is just stay connected with me. I will give you the opportunities if you pray for them, if you look for them, if you keep your eyes open for them, to see people that are hurting. We're, we live in a dark world. I was going to say you believe that, but I, I can just tell you. Uh, we live in a dark world. There are many dark places. And you guys know that to be true. There are people that are going to spend an eternity away from God in those dark places unless we go and bring the light of Christ to them. So my challenge is, can we not be selfish? Can we not be too worried about our own to-do list? And be more concerned with what God lays on our heart to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray today as we close the series of being City on the Hill, God, we, we know that we have the ability, but Lord, there's so many things that kind of block our way from doing the things that we're supposed to do, Lord, and sometimes it starts with our what's in our own minds. We are consumed with our guilt, or we're consumed with our, our mistakes, God, so just quickly I pray for those that are feeling that way, Lord, that may they believe in the scripture when it says that when you confess, when we confess sins to you, that you remove them as far as the east is from the west. And if today is the day that they said no more, I'm going to stop doing X, Y, and Z, or I'm going to start living my life for you, Jesus. Maybe today is the day they do that. They, they claim that promise uh, in Romans 10, 9, and 10, and that they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. So Lord, I pray today for those that are uh, hanging on to their past, and they're just playing that reel in their mind over and over so they feel like they're never able to share the good news of your son Jesus because of their past. But we pray in, in Christ and faith believing that today they're going to repent from that and live a life closer to you. Lord, I pray for those that are just kind of socially um, selfish, that we, just, we want to spend time doing our own thing. So Lord, I pray that you would convict us, challenge us, to go to the places where people are, to get out of our routines, and to have God conversations. Lord, there's a lot of good things that we do, God, that help us do, do what you want us to do, the God things in our life. And Lord, we pray for those that are um, just struggling. You know, they're having a hard time. Their life is, is just full of anxious thoughts and worried uh, ideas. Lord, we pray for your peace today for them. That it, it says in your word that you can give us a peace that goes beyond understanding. So I pray for peace today for those that are struggling. They can't even remotely think about sharing the good news of, of your son Jesus because they're so worried, with their, they're so weighed down by their own anxious and nervous and worrisome thoughts. God, we give those to you today. We lay them at the foot of the cross and say, God, take them from us. Help us to not worry so much about our own stuff, but be more concerned about what you would have us to be concerned about, being the light of the world. God, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. And as we go, I think sometimes uh, 
this was such a wonderful call that Jason gave us, but sometimes we just need to feel like there's a blessing upon us, that God is going with us. And so Austin and I, we want to sing this blessing over you. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of God that made you and the Son that saved you and the Spirit that sustains you. Have an awesome Sunday and we'll see you here next week.